All right, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Let, open your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 4. We'll get ready to continue in our study this morning. But first, first we pray. Father, thank you so much for being our God. Not just the God of the universe, but our God. Lord, which speaks so much of the time when you decided to come down. Reveal yourself to us. Open your arms to us. Invite us to come to you. And you became our God. Now, Lord, we want to hear from our God this morning. As we open our Bibles, open our hearts, we pray to hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, Genesis, uh, just two verses this morning. Genesis chapter 4, verses 25 through 26. And it goes like this. And Adam knew his wife again. And she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew, and to Seth. To him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began man, men to call upon the name of the Lord. All right, now, in our last study, what we saw in the line of Cain, as he, as it, we saw him build his community, the community of Cain. And this was a godless community because they wanted lives without God. They wanted families without God. They wanted conversations among themselves that didn't bring God into the, into the talk. They wanted cultures without God, governments without God. They wanted science without God. They wanted to sleep without God. They didn't want to dream about God. They wanted to wake up without God. And they wanted any assistance that they needed in life without God. And that's how you characterize the line of Cain. It is a line that is without God. Why? Because they did exactly what it says in Romans 1.28. You can characterize this line like this. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Then it says God gave them up and so forth. That phrase, they did not like to retain God, that characterizes the line of Cain. I don't like to say political things, but it's very interesting that the Democratic National Committee removed God from their platform and Jerusalem. That should have been a message to both Christians and Jews. Um, because Why do they do that? because they did not like to retain God in their platform. And all of this description of the line of Cain, the lives, they did not like to retain God. They wanted new lives without God. It leaves us as we study this, and especially if we get around these, th this type of environment, it leaves us with a deep sense of an emptiness and a void and, 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 a, and a howl, like being in a howling wind is the way it makes us feel, this without God. And we're not like, we don't want to be that. And so as we, last week, as we left the last words of Lamech, where it all culminated in him, and we, see, we saw in verse 24 a man who not only murdered, but bragged about his murders. And he, we felt just so terrible inside, and we, it, it makes us look up to heaven and say, to, and ask God, why are you allowing this to happen? Why are you allowing this terrible scene to develop like this? Why? This is your earth, God. This is your, th these are your creations. Why are you allowing this earth to be so much not thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why, God? And the answer comes back to us because God is looking for those individuals within the line of Cain who will say, enough. That's it. I personally am tired of living a life without God. I must have God. I will run out and cross over the line. I'll run over to the other side with God. And God wants that. And to those individuals in the line of Cain, 
that, that God stretches out his arms to them. And he's just like he's saying in Romans 10, 21, to Israel he saith all day long, have I stretched forth my hands all day long, all, all millennia long, all, long, all time long since Cain was born. He's been stretching forth his hand. In a particular case in Romans 10, speaking about Israel, he calls them a disobedient and a gainsaying people. But he stretches out his hands. It's God. And he's reaching out to Cain. And he's saying to them, go ahead. Cross over the line. Run over. Come over to the with God side. I'll take care of you. I'm the good shepherd. That's what he's saying. Now, Seth, We've studied chapter 4. We focused our attention on Cain and his line. But now, let's just turn back and look at two other individuals and ask the question, what's going on with them? Who are those individuals? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Just think what it was like for them. Chapter 4 that we've been studying was a pretty rough time for the couple, Adam and Eve. This chapter started off with the couple so hopeful that at last their personal dilemma was going to be solved. And Eve spoke for both of them when she said, I have finally gotten the man God, the Savior. But she was wrong, they were wrong. And instead, they watched Cain grow up to be not the man God, Savior, but the devil. And, and, and that he was. And they just, they lost hope. And in verse 2, as they named their next child Abel, or vanity, it was they were naming him, he is a breath that has come and gone. And that statement of despair in verse 2 of the meaning of name, Abel's name is really the last time that we hear from Adam and Eve, or Eve for Adam, uh, as, as the rest of the chapter just develops out. And it's a really hard time for Adam and Eve, because they just sat back and they watched the most horrifying scenes develop right in front of their eyes. And they, and, and, and they can't believe it. They're watching in horror as they sit back and they see their son Cain develop into a self-willed, arrogant rebel against God and his ways. And so Adam and Eve, they just sat back and they watched in horror as their son Cain rejected God's gracious warning before he murdered Abel. And God, they watched God graciously advise Cain. Cain, as God was seeing what was going on in his heart, the anger that was rising up. He said he, uh, God was advising Cain, Cain, throw down your weapons of rebellion against me. Take a stand against your sinful anger inside of you. That was verses 6 and 7. And Adam and Eve just watched in horror as they saw their son Cain rise up and kill his brother Abel in verse 8. And Adam and Eve just, just watched in horror as they sat back and they, they saw Cain, their son Cain, lied to God about what he had just done when he killed Abel. And then they saw their son Cain push back God with that sarcastic remark about, am I my brother's keeper, in verse 9. And Adam and Eve just watched in horror as they saw their, Cain, their, their son Cain not repent and cry out to God in mercy when he was caught by God in verse 11. And Adam and Eve just watched in horror as they saw their son Cain worry more about his punishment than the sin that he had committed in verse 13. And then they saw and they watched in horror as their son Cain made his final decision for his life and set the course for his line when he went out from the presence of the Lord in verse 16. And they sat back and they watched in horror as the line of Cain became a people who go out from the presence of God, who do not like to retain God. And that's in verses 17 through 22. And they watched this happen. They are in horrified state as they sit back and they watch 
Cain's line culminate in this, in their, what is their great, 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 great grandson, Lamech, who not only became a murderer like Cain, but went one step further to brag about his murder and to say he would overdo Cain in his murder, in, uh, in his murderous spirit, in verses 23 through 24. So what do you do if you're Adam and you're, and you're Eve and you watch this continuation of your, you see the continuation of your physical family, but it's an absolute crumbling as it goes forward of your family values of, godlessness, of, God, of godliness. You have family values of godliness. You are Adam and Eve. And you see your son just blossom and prosper and completely destroy and throw down those values and become godlessness. What do you do? And what do you do when you know that your responsibility, because you heard it from God in Genesis 1.28, is to go out and be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth with the seed of God. But your children are the seed of the devil. What do you do? And what do you do when you know that, that the purpose for a man and a woman, for Adam and Eve, to physically come together is to have children so that God can do what he said he wants to do with this, through this marriage in uh, Malachi 2.15. And did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. <clears throat> what does God want? from a husband and a wife. And you know this. And you want, he wants the couple to provide him with the opportunity to seek a godly seed. And yet Adam and Eve have come together physically and have produced an ungodly seed. And what do you do? What do you do when you know that God wants you to have children so he can seek a godly seed and you produced a seed of the devil? And you say to yourself, maybe it was me. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I didn't do a good job training up Cain in the way that he should go. And maybe I'm to blame. And you sink into a deep depression as you think about you and your wife and how you must have failed to obey God. What do you do? And what do you do when you love God so much and all you really want to do in life is just to please God? You want to make him happy, don't make him mad. And you want to give God, you want to present God, say, look, God, look what I did for you. I'm presenting to you a godly seed. And that's, all you, and that's what you want, because the Bible talks about a vision, a chazon. And it says a vision or a dream or a chazon is so important in Proverbs 29, 18, because it says where there's no chazon, where there's no vision, the people just perish. They just wither away. And what do you do at the birth of your son Cain, when you have such a chazon, you have such a vision that you said, this, my vision for this boy, he's gonna be the man God savior, I've got him. And you say that, and instead your vision, it just vanishes away because he turns out to be a murderous, lying devil. And what do you do when your dreams of life just vanish away? And you're so discouraged and you're so disappointed. And you ex what, because what you expected didn't happen and what you see is just like breath vanishing away before your eyes. And so you even name your next born son vanishing breath. And what do you do? We do as believers what it says to do in these situations in Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, he shall strengthen thine heart. We wait, we ask God to strengthen our weak hearts, and we turn our eyes upon Jesus, and we look full in his wonderful face, and we wait for his next move. We wait to see what God's going to do next. We do what it says in Exodus 14, 13. Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you. 
We refuse to fear. We turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and we wait for his next move. We wait to see what he's going to do. We do what it says in Psalm 25, 15. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. We wait. We turn our eyes upon Jesus. We look full in his wonderful face, and we wait to see what he's going to do next. Adam and Eve had to go through this. And they turned their eyes from all the horror of seeing Cain and his line develop. And as they turned their eyes away from their own vanishing chazon, their own vanishing vision, and they turned their eyes upon Jesus, and they looked full in his wonderful face, they waited for God's next move. And what was the next move? They saw that as the Lion of Cain was growing and prospering, it looked like there was no hope. There was no chazon. There was no vision for the people of God, which numbered two, Adam and Eve. And when it looked like the people of God were just going to able, just going to vanish away like a breath, then God made his move. That's verse 25. Verse 25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. That word that's used there for another, acher, it means next. Next. Remember? Wait for God's next move. It means next. It's the same word that God used when he told Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have, in the most unlikely circumstances, a son Isaac in Genesis 17, 21. And he said this, By, But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Next. Next year. Our God is is the God of the next. Our God is the God of the another, as in seed. Our God is the God of the again. And so why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ is seeking a godly seed. And he said that he would not be deterred in seeking this godly seed. He said that in, 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 uh, because in Malachi 2.15, it says that it, it, the, we know that the godly seed is his church. And his church is the body of all believers. That's his church. And he spoke about it in Matthew 16, 18, when he said, I'll build my church. And then he didn't say, I'll tell you what, but I'll put it in there. And I'll tell you what. He says, the gates of hell won't prevail against it. He says, I'm going to do it. And the line of Cain will not prevail against it. I will build my church. So when Adam and Eve turned their eyes away from their chazon that vanished, their vision as, uh, <coughs> of Cain as the man God's savior, when they turned their eyes away from, from and, and, and they forgot about their son Abel who had been killed, and they turned their eyes to God and focused on him, then came the new vision. Then came the new hope. Then came the birth of Seth. And Adam and Eve did exactly what Paul did in the past when he was speaking about his life. And he said in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count my, not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, he says, he says, here's a life pattern for me, forgetting those things which are behind. But the line of, but, but, but Abel was killed, forgetting those things which are behind. But the line of Cain is prospering and they're just, they're seeming to have, they're the ones filling the earth without, without God, forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching forth, Paul said, stretching out and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Now there's a big, big difference in what Eve said at the birth of Cain in verse 1 and what she said at the birth of Seth in verse 25. Very important. In verse 1, chapter uh, Genesis 4, 1, Eve said, I have gotten a man, God. I've gotten a man who is God. Eve was so consumed with her own personal needs that what was all important to her was what she could get. I got this man. It's all about Eve and Adam's problem. 
But in verse 25, there's really a new emphasis. Because the new emphasis with Eve, there's a change that's happened here, is that now it's not what I got, but it's what God has appointed. It's what God is doing. It's no longer what I got. It's now what God is doing. And that's the important thing. She was all consumed before with what her needs were. Just like us, when we pray, and we pray, how do we pray? We pray, so, you know, like God doesn't know. God, I need, 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 need. You know, and, 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 and evil is like us when we pray, I need all. But God knows what we need. He already knows that. We don't have to inform him. It's, in fact, he said in Isaiah 65, 24, before they call, I'll, before they call I will answer. And while they're yet speaking, I will hear. So you could say, God, you haven't let me finish yet. <laughs> You're answering already? That's because he's God. Why? Because in Psalm 103, 14, it says he knows our frame. And he remembers that we are dust. So there's a shift in what I got to what God is doing. And it's very significant because she came to realize the best solution for her problems was not to immerse herself in her own needs, but was to immerse herself in God and what he was doing. That freed Eve to be able to say, I love God because of what he does, not because of what he does for me, because, but of what he does. You know, that was a trial of Abraham. When Abraham, uh, uh, when the trial of Abraham in Genesis 22.1 was really the question, did he transfer over to this? Did he transform to this level? And that's why it says in Genesis 22.1, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt or test Abraham. And, Abraham, and he said, uh, said unto him, Abraham, he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son whom thou lovest, and get thee unto the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I will tell thee of. You'd think that Abraham would say, you can't even tell me the mountain it is going to be as my only son. It's, not, it's so nonchalant for you, you can't even tell us which mountain it is. Anyway, but Abraham's lifting up the knife to sacrifice his son Isaac. And he's saying to God, as he's lifting up this knife, he says, I love you more than my son. I love you more than the son, the only son, whom I love. And in that trial, because he did that, the Lord Jesus Christ was really asking Abraham the same thing he asked Peter in John 21, 15. Peter said to, the Lord Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Abraham, lovest thou me more than Isaac, who's on that altar before you? That's the question. The question was not, who do you love? The question was, who do you love more? And that was the, that was the test. And so after Abraham passed the test, God told him in Genesis twenty-two sixteen. 16, he said, by, and he said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, that because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, God emphasized, that in blessing I will bless thee. That's such a beautiful picture. It's like God saying, when I'm in the practice of blessing you, I'll step out of myself and bless you. I'll really bless you. <laughs> and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of thy enemies, and, all, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. And you could say, because thou loved me more than Isaac. And that teaches us a principle that whatever we give to God, he will return to us with interest, great interest. Because Abraham was willing to give to God his only son. Therefore, God returned to Abraham not only his son Isaac, but great interest when he said, your children are going to be like the sand of the sea and the stars of the air. That's wonderful. That's a principle with God. That whatever you give to God, whatever we give to God, he will give back to us with much more of the same that we gave. Much more of the same. But whatever you withhold from God, King Solomon put it this way in Proverbs 11, 24. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but attendeth to poverty. So the only way that we can make ourselves 
willing to not withhold, because this is the question, so how do you do this from God, is to immerse ourselves in the goodness of God. It, to convince ourselves God is good. God is very, very good. Then we'll be able to go to the point where Job did, to rise to this level, where Job said in Job 13, 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And what did Job mean by that? He meant that when he found God, he found that this was a God of great goodness. This was a God to love because of his goodness, and this was a God to trust even if he kills me. Job saying, I'm so convinced that he's so good. I'm so convinced of Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God. I'm so convinced that if he kills me, it's better. It's better because God's good. That's what he meant. Well, this shift happened to Eve. And she became, well, she became more concerned and more focused on what God was doing over how it affected her. So in the verse 25, she says, appointed. God has appointed. It means to establish. It means to set. It means to put. It's the same root word. It's the same word as the word Seth. That's what she names her son. Seth, after that issue, after that point, it's the same word. Same root. It means to set or to put. And to see this transition in Eve, just pretend that, that we had all three sons of Adam and Eve sitting up here and we're interviewing it, right? So we're like Clint Eastwood and we have an empty chair here. <laughs> and we come to Cain and we ask Cain, Cain, tell us, what does your name mean and what's the background of how your mom chose that name for you? And Cain would say, well, my, my name means gotten. Because my mom thought that with me, she had gotten the man God Savior. Who is, she's, but I showed her how wrong she was. Now, go to the next son. <clears throat> we go to, to go next one, Abel. And we say to him, Abel, what does your name mean? And what's the background of how your mom chose that name for you? And Abel would say, my name means vanishing like a vanishing breath. Because my mom was so disappointed at how my brother turned out that she gave up all hope of getting the man God Savior, so she names me Vanishing. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> I hope he's got a different name in heaven. Uh, so <laughs> or maybe he doesn't, I don't know. It's just room. Anyway, then we go to the next son, Seth, and ask him, Seth, what does your name mean? And give me the background of how your mom chose that name for you. And so Seth would say, my name means established. My name means set. Because my mom turned her eyes away from what she thought she got but didn't get from God. And, to, and she turned her eyes to, onto what God was doing. And when she did that, she did that, she saw that I and my children were going to be the godly seed that God would set or establish on the earth. He got the best name. Anyway, <clears throat> now we come to the birth of, uh, of Seth's son, Enos. And that's given to us as the line of Seth begins to blossom out in verse 26. And to Seth, to him also, there was a, a born a son... And he called his name Enos. Be, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Seth named his son Enos. Enos means mortal. Enos means frail. Enos means weak. Like and sickly. And so now you can see that from this naming of the godly seed, it shows, it, talk, it, it really refers to how the godly seed sees themselves how they see themselves. The worldly seed of Ken, Cain sees themselves as self-sufficient, as they're up for the task. Whatever it is, they can do it themselves. They can meet any challenge. They alone can do it. They don't need a crutch. They don't need anyone else. They're the man. But the godly seed are in the fear of God 
and they see themselves like Psalm 920 says, put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. They're just men. Just men. That's, that's a, 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 just a man. That's what God, that was the message that God was sending to Adam. Adam was named by God. And God said to Adam, or God didn't say to Adam, he, he called his name Adam. He says, your name's Adam. It means red. It refers to the earth. It goes back to dust. And he says, and he told him in Genesis 3, 19, in the sweat of thy face, that's what he's telling me, the sweat of thy face. <laughs> that sounds like me sweating. Anyway, thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thy taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That's encompassed in the name Adam because it refers to the redness of the earth. And so what he was really telling him, he was, in other words, the naming of Adam, the naming of Enos was continuing along in the, in the vein of how God was, was naming. Na God named Adam, and so Seth named his son Enos along the same vein. Because what the real message was through these names was that man can only find his eternal life in God. Apart from God, he doesn't have any eternal life. That's, he says, John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, be connected. Uh, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Man can only find his life purpose, his purpose in life in God. Apart from God, he doesn't have any purpose in life. As it says in Job 12, 25, they grope in the dark without light. So by naming his son Enos, or mortal or weakness, Seth wanted his son to know for all of his life, he was saying to his son, you never forget the fact you are mortal, you are frail, and you are weak, and therefore you need to run to the one who said in John 15, 15, I am the vine, and, and Enos, you're the branch. You are the branches, and he that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Because in us, in and of yourself, apart from God, without me, just like the line of Cain, without God, for without me, you can do in us nothing. Because you're mortal, because you're frail, because you're weak. Just like when Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, he said, I'd take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am in us, when I am weak and frail and mortal, he says, then I'm strong. Now why was he saying, why did Paul say, when I am weak, when I am in us, I'm strong? Why? Because <clears throat> that's the only way we seek God. We don't seek God until we know that we are in us that we are mortal and weak. We, just, we, 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 we are very good at tricking ourselves. We deceive ourselves. God said, you got a big problem, God the physician. He says, your big problem is your heart, and electrophysiology won't fix it. <laughs> like I'm going to have on Tuesday. But he says, because why? Because he says, your heart, he says, is, 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 is deceitful. Well, how deceitful is it, God, above all things? And it's wicked. Well, how wicked is it, God? Desperately wicked, he says. Desperately wicked. And so <clears throat> we, 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 we deceive ourselves into thinking that we're strong, we're bulletproof, we're smarter than the average bear, and that's a problem. And so what do you do when you really have that disease of self-deception? You do, you, you pray the prayer of David, king of Israel, in Psalm 39, 4, when he said, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. That's the key, is to pray that prayer. I got the problem, Lord. Make me know <clears throat> mine end, how many days I have left, and how frail I am. So, if we were to interview in us and ask him the same thing that we asked Cain and Abel and Seth, it might go like this. So tell me, Enos, what does your name mean? And what's the background of how your dad, because his dad chose his name, just chose the name for you? And Enos would say, my name means mortal. My name means weakness and frailty. Why? 
because my dad always wanted me to remember how mortal, how weak, and how frail I am. So I'd never forget, I need God. I must have God. I want to be on the group that's with God. And by Seth naming his son Enos, he started, the, what happened there is something wonderful occurred. Because by Seth naming, there's a tie-in on this verse. By Seth naming his son Enos, a practice started from that point. That practice would characterize the godly seed on earth. It would show the difference between the godly seed and the ungodly seed. You could walk into hometown buffet and you watch the people who bow their heads to thank God and you'll say, that's the practice right there. There it is right there. And you watch all the other people just sit down, eat their food. That's the difference. There's a practice that started here, and it's called the practice of beginning to call on the name of the Lord. And look how it's set up. And to Seth also, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name mortal, weakness, frailty, enos. Then began man, men to call, to call, that's the Hebrew word kara, upon the name of the Lord. Since this is the practice of the godly seed. This is our practice that characterizes us from the ungodly seed that it's very important for us to know what does that mean in Genesis 4, 26 when it says, then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. Because that word began in Genesis 4, 26 is a, means to, to begin. <laughs> it means to start. It's like a transformation. It wasn't happening before then. And this was the point where it now starts to occur. And this is the great, this, we call this the great Genesis 4.26 transformation. Because this happened to, to the, in the line of man, in the, in the uh, Seth's line. It happens to every single believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Genesis 4.26 transformation when we as individuals begin to call upon the name of the Lord and that's what happens at our salvation. That's how we're saved and that's what starts a practice throughout the rest of our lives of doing this. So what does it mean to call? What does it mean, kara, upon the name of the Lord? Kara is a universal word. But it, in this particular context, it has a, in other words, when I say universal word, it's used in many places, many times. But in this particular context, it has a particular meaning. And that's what we want to probe out. That's what we want to investigate. Because God wants us to know this particular meaning of this word kara. So to see this particular meaning, we investigate in the scripture and watch the word just come alive for us. And so we look at a few other places where Kara is used. Now here we have Potiphar's wife. And she's giving her testimony. I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The only trouble was she didn't. But nevertheless, <clears throat> she, did. She, she, she gives her testimony in Genesis 39, 14 through 15, and where she said, Then she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us, to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me. And I cried, Kara, with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, Kara, that he left his garment with me, fled, and got him away. That gives us a particu the particular meaning of the word Kara here in Genesis 4, 26. Then man began men to call upon the name of the Lord. It doesn't just be, mean, you know, well, where's God's phone number? I'll just give him a call. That's not what it means. It means crying out like a woman <clears throat> who is when she is violated. Now let's look at another case. So in, in uh, Isaiah 40, verse 3, the word's used, and it says, The voice of him that crieth, kara, in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. How do you cry in the wilderness? Do you kind of like... Prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. You don't do that. But if you're bringing the message to, to, to th that great message to the Jewish people that the Messiah God has come, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's their God, 
then you cry out, you kara, like it says in six verses later, when it says, O Zion that bringest good tidings, get thee up into a high mountain. And O Jerusalem that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, kara, say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. When you kara out that message, you get into a high mountain, you lift up your voice with strength, and you karat out, behold your God, here's your God right here. That's the meaning behind the word in Genesis 4, 26. Then began men to call on the name of the Lord. So <clears throat> that's the same word that's used for how people are saved in Joel 2, 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall kara shall call on the name of the Lord. That's the same phrase as in Genesis 4, 26, shall be delivered or saved, as it says in Acts 2.21. So when you're desperate and you're, you're, you're in your, you picture yourself in a lifeboat at sea and, and you see a ship in a distance out there, what do you do? You, do you just say, you know, help, I'm over here, save me. You know, you cry out the top of your lungs. That's what it means. That's the Joel 2.32 particular meaning for this word. <clears throat> and that's what it means. It's a, it's a transformation that takes place, this Genesis 4, 26. Because when a person sees, my name, color me Enos, my name is now Enos, my name is now frail and mortal and weak, color me that way, because that's how I color myself, then they begin to call on the name of the Lord, and not until then. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, he did a big, great teaching on this, on the meaning of this, this word, this particular meaning of kara, and calling on the name of the Lord, in Luke, 5, <clears throat> Luke 11, 5 through 10. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight? Think about that, at midnight. Go unto him at midnight. My wife and I have all these conversations because we live on the West Coast, and I'm trying to call somebody on the East Coast, and I say, do you think she'll mind? It's like, you know, seven at, seven at night in San Diego. It's like 10 at night. Is that okay? And of course, my wife always says, no, it's not okay. You can't call then. <laughs> this is midnight, okay? <laughs> this is worse. And says unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. <laughs> okay. Read my lips. <laughs> he says, the door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I <laughs> so what happens? I say unto you, though he will not rise, and the Lord said, he's not coming. He's not coming. <laughs> he give him because he is his friend. He won't come because he's his friend. That's what God says. But, he says, because of his importunity. Now, that's a common word we use every day, isn't it? <laughs> because of his importunity, he'll rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, keep on asking, and it'll be given to you. Keep on seeking, it shall be given you. And, and, and it shall find. Knock, and it'll be opened unto you. Because he that ke keeps on finding, and so <clears throat> everyone, for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that receiveth findeth, him that knocketh shall be opened. So here's a man. He has an unexpected visitor. He has nothing to give his visitor to eat. The stores are closed. The man needs three loaves of bread from his neighbor for his unexpected visitor. And he will not take no for an answer. He will not be turned away. It doesn't matter that it's midnight. He's going to get that bread. It doesn't matter that the lights are out next door. He's going to get that bread. It doesn't matter that his neighbor is yelling from inside, leave me alone and stop making trouble. He's going to get that bread. It doesn't matter that he's waking up the whole neighborhood. He's going to get that bread. It doesn't matter his neighbor is yelling to him. The door's locked. We're already in bed. I cannot get up and give him. He's going to get that bread. And I have a son like that. <laughs> so I know where and I speak. <laughs> and that neighbor, and that's why he's in charge of sales at our company, because he's not going to take no from an answer. Just this last week, Abbott Laboratories, so 
that he wants the, he wants to get them to come out, and so he goes there, makes a video, shows them, you know, come out to Takati and see our facility down there, and they say, well, maybe we'll come. So what does he do? He goes down to the the our kitchen down there in Takati and has them make up, according to his taste, the best salsa, three different types that they can make, the best chorizo, the best chips, tastes the whole thing, patches up, send it over there, FedEx overnight, and, and puts a line, uh, puts a note that says, for the rest of the meal, you have to come to Cotty. <laughs> and if they don't, they'll be the next round, because he won't take no for an answer. And this, this man will not take no for an answer. So the neighbor gets up, gives him as much bread as he wants. He says, take it all, just leave me alone. Why? Because that man carod out. Because he kept on asking, he kept on seeking, he kept on finding until he broke down the resistance of his neighbor. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ said he got the bread because of his importunity. So the Yiddish definition is two words for importunity. Chutzpah, which means nerve, <laughs> and nudge, <laughs> which means nudge. <laughs> because it took a lot of nerve for that man to bang on the door at midnight, wake everybody up, and, and uh, <clears throat> that's a picture of Karah. That's a picture of Genesis 4-9. Then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. Because that word means it, you break through all the barriers with your chutzpah and your nudging, and you don't stop. A mother has just lost her son. Uh, and she was old, and she never should have had a son in the first place because she was infertile. But the prophet Elijah said she's going to have a son, and she had a son. And now this son goes out one day, he gets a headache and dies. And she's absolutely desperate. She thinks to herself, if he told me I was going to have a son when I shouldn't have a son, he can bring the son back to life. And so she doesn't tell anybody. She's got the kara burning inside of her. And she goes in 2 Kings 4, 7, 27, when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. And the man of God said, let her alone. Her soul is vexed. That's a picture of a desperate woman about to be thrust away by Gehazi, but in desperation she clings because she's got it. She's got the meaning of Genesis 4, 26, that then began man to kara upon the name of the Lord. And at that moment, she had the Genesis 4, 26 transformation. And her name became Enos. And she knew that she was mortal and weak and frail. And then she began, as a Jewish mother, to call and kara upon the name of of this prophet, Elijah, upon the name of the Lord. There was a mother whose daughter was so hopelessly possessed with the devil, the devil and her daughter probably threw her daughter down into uncontrolled fits and seizures, tyrannical seizures. When the mother would look into the eyes of her daughter, she would say, that's not my daughter. That's another person in there. And she was possessed with the devil. And that mother felt so in us, so mortal, so frail, so, so, so helpless, so weak, and she had been to all the doctors, she had been to all the exorcists, and no one was able to get that devil out of her daughter. And she was so desperate, there was only one problem. She heard about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, that he'd healed so many. But the problem was, she was a hated Canaanite. She wasn't Jewish. And so what does this mother do? She realizes, I've only got hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so she can't stand it to see it any longer. And so even though she's from a hated people, she presses through to break through the Jewish crowd. And in Matthew 15, 22, it says, Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and, and cried. She got it. She got the kara. And saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. She got the calling on the name of the Lord part. My daughter is grievously vexed. This Gentile woman has broken through the press of the Jewish people. She is, they're all looking at her in absolute amazement, but she's so desperate that she goes through the Genesis 4, 26 transformation. And she calls on the name of the Lord. And, what, and she doesn't just say, excuse me, um, <clears throat> I know I'm not supposed to be here. Would you just have mercy on me, thou son of the Lord? He doesn't do that. She cries out. She caras out. And her kara out is heard that the Jewish disciples, in verse 23, when he didn't answer a word, the disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she kara after us. She's crying after us. And Rabbi Jesus, he looks at that, and he says, perfect. 
perfect. Now, he could have just said, your daughter's healed, go away. He didn't do that because he said, the classroom has been set. The stage is now ready. He said, I will teach my people the truth of Genesis 4.26. I will teach them what they don't have, the kara. I'll show them now. And so he says, he says, there's one thing i got to teach you here. He's thinking to himself, one thing i got to teach them. i got to teach them the truth of Isaiah 29, 13. For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, but their lips do honor me, but they have removed their heart. They don't have any kara. From me, far from me, he said. So Rabbi Jesus, he steps up there and he says, let the lesson begin. And he says to them in verse 26, he answered and said, it's not meat, it's not appropriate to take the children's dead and cast it to dogs. Oh, this one was just called a dog. <laughs> so, she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, perfect. He said, he didn't say perfect. He said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee as thou, as thou wilt. Her daughter was made whole from the very hour. He just put a big barrier in front of that woman by calling her a dog. And that woman said, you can call me whatever you want. I'll kara over every barrier you put in front of me. I'll get there. Because she got it. And she had the Genesis 4.26 transformation. She said, color me frail, mortal, and weak. Because I'm going to kara right over every barrier that you put in front of me. And she did. And that was the time when the Lord Jesus Christ then could look to his, to his own people and said, she got it. How come you don't get it? She, she had the Genesis 4.26 transformation. She, colors, she saw herself as mortal, frail, and weak, and therefore she called on my name. Why not you? What's wrong with you? He didn't say it that way. But <clears throat> that's what he maybe wanted to say. Anyway, but she got it. That was the sense that Jacob, he was looking at his angry brother Esau. The last thing he heard about Esau 25 years ago was that he was comforting himself with the thought of, of killing him. Jacob, how shall I kill him? Let me count the ways. You know, he was just like that, you know. And, 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 and this made him comfort, right? And he knew that. And it's 25 years later, and he hears that they're going to have a reunion, and Esau is coming with 400 men. 400 to 13, 1 plus 12 sons. And I don't know how well they can fight. Anyway, <clears throat> 400 swords are coming down the road, and, 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 and Jacob meets the Lord Jesus Christ at night, and before that meeting... He, at that meeting, he wrestles with him all night long. He's got a thigh out of joint. Boy, he's ain't us. He's weak, mortal, and frail. He's got a thigh out of joint. And it says in Genesis 32, 26, the, that Jacob says, that he said, the Lord said, let me go for the day breaketh. And Jacob, he said, I will not let thee go unless thou bless me. He had the kara. And that statement, I will not let thee go, that's the meaning. And at that moment, Jacob has his Genesis 4.26 transformation. And he sees, himself, he sees himself so weak, and he calls him the Lord. And, and God said, you got it. He says, you got it. You, we're going to memorialize it. We'll have a name change here, a ceremony of a main name change. Before you were Jacob, today you're Israel. Why? Because you got the Genesis 4.26 transformation. He says, you got power, like a prince, with God and man. So the, so the question is, do we all have the Genesis 4.26 transformation? Have we all come to see our weakness, mortality, and <clears throat> frailness? If I don't see it, I'll get another diagnosis. <laughs> have we all come to see that? And have we all embraced it like it was our name in us? To the point where we are, where, where, where we know about ourselves, what it says in Revelation 3, 17. Knowest thou not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked? And then we take the next step of the Genesis 4, 26 transformation, which is the Revelation 3, 20. We hear the voice, we open the door, he comes in, he sups with us, us with him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for, Lord, given us the experiences of life that bring us to this Genesis 4.26 transformation that make us see we are in us. 
that make us begin and carry out throughout our lives, not just to casually call, but to call out to you on the name of the Lord, calling on the name of the Lord. Help us, we pray, and help those with whom we come in contact with also to help them to have this, this transformation that they might see themselves mortal, frail, and weak and call on the name of the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.